Hello everyone. This is Dating for Widows and Widowers, a presentation I just gave at the 2023 Widow and Widower Conference in Salt Lake City. My name is Sharon Collier. You can find me at Sharon Olson Collier on Facebook. I am a certified life and relationship coach. I am also half of the Date to Your Potential podcast team. We are on Spotify right now only, and you would have to search the Date to Your Potential podcast. I am the mother to four gorgeous children and a gorgeous son-in-law. And of course, I am mom to two beautiful fur babies. I am a suicide widow of 16 years now. I am a self-proclaimed former bad dater. This is part of my story. The picture was an advertisement I did for a class I did on baggage, but I have since dropped a lot of my baggage. Uh, part of my story was uh, I had a really hard marriage with my husband and I made a lot of really bad decisions about myself based on his behavior. So when I put myself out in the dating world, I made a lot of really stupid mistakes. Well, I probably made all of the stupid mistakes. So I started researching love and attraction. And I did that for several years. Um, while I was dating, um, while I was making fewer mistakes. And honestly, I really started dating just a higher quality of men and just had much better dating experiences, which gave me actually a lot of confidence. Okay, so this is probably what my life looked like when I first put myself out there in the dating world. I waited a year until after my husband died, and I put a lot of efforts into finding a spouse. That was my normal, even though the marriage wasn't really healthy, um, I was just trying to replace. I just went out there and I was medicating myself with dating, I was trying to replace my husband. Um, and it really did consume a lot of my life, which was not healthy. Then I found this amazing group of widowers and widows that were local and went to lots of different activities. And my life was a lot happier, but it still looked like this, where I was still dating here and there. And of course, I had my house and kids and my job and church. But a lot of my energy and time went into social groups, which still was very unbalanced. So this is what my life should have looked like. It should have looked very balanced and which it does look more like now. And we will talk about this um, later on. This is what you should look like while you're out there dating. Uh, this is the question I get all the time from widows and widowers is, when is it okay to start dating? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about grief and widow fog as it applies to me. Okay, this is what your regular brain is doing. Now, if it was a guy brain, it would probably be three or four rows parallel to each other because guys tend to um, tend to not do a whole lot of things at once. Compartmentalize is the word I'm looking for. This is a lady brain. And you know, off ramps and on ramps, kids at school, job, um, soccer practice, just doing a lot of things. And it's all processing all that at the same time. Okay, this is what grief brain is doing. Maybe sometimes this, but most of the time it's this. And let me explain. Okay, your frontal lobe is responsible for planning and organization, concentration, and completing tasks. It is also responsible for understanding decision making and inhibitions and logic. And it only processes one thing at a time. When you're in grief brain, you can really only process one thing at a time. 
Okay, grief brain overloads your frontal cortex by forcing it to process too much information. So it fails to think rationally to try to make sense of emotions. So in a nutshell, your frontal cortex is so busy processing your grief, it's having a hard time doing anything else. Okay, and then of course we have stress. I don't know about any of you, but I thought, um, especially in the beginning, that life was really stressful, all of a sudden going from two parents to one. This can cause hormone imbalances and a flood of cortisol, which we can talk about the effects. Um, added sugar in your bloodstream gives you sugar cravings. Weight gain usually around the middle, rounding oh, and rounding of the face. Acne, easy bruising, slowed healing, and fatigue. It actually starts in your hypothalamus, which is responsible for your whole endocrine system, which is your all your hormonal system. And um, when you get stressed out, you actually start spewing cortisol. So there's no such thing as a grief dating profile. I actually had somebody ask me, where's that website with the grief profile? There is not one, but if you are in the middle of grief, if you have not processed through a lot of it, this is what it might look like. I know Mutual doesn't have an about me section anymore, but like I think, um, Match.com still does, and most everybody's seen an About Me section, so it would go something like this. Newly widowed Latter-day Saint looking for someone to fill the hole in my heart. I can't decide what to do for fun or even what to make for dinner. Don't take it personal if I'm cranky. I haven't had a good night's sleep since my spouse passed. I'll probably talk about my late spouse a lot because they were perfect and you need to measure up. I really can't think straight, but if you feed me sugar, I'll probably like you. So it's important we get through enough of our grief to be thinking rationally, right? Um, I wanna talk about trauma for a minute. Um, my partner, Peggy, my podcast partner, Peggy, that sounded funny, um, actually took over this part. Um, trauma and grief equals fear plus loss. It all of a sudden adds fear to your loss. Trauma does different things to your brain than grief does. Okay, some of the signs of physical trauma, eating disturbances, eating less or more than usual, uh, sleep disturbances, the same, more or less than usual, low energy and exhaustion, or chronic unexplained pain. I have often heard people talk about the physical pain of grief and trauma. Now, you know you're in trauma. Trauma usually is when um, there is a sudden death maybe a suicide or a car accident. And then some people just process the death of a spouse, even if they've had a long time to say goodbye as trauma. And, you know, we all know how raw uh, grief is. So it's, it's just how everybody takes it a little bit differently. Okay, emotional, depression, sadness, spontaneous crying, shame, despair, and hopelessness anxiety, panic attacks, fearfulness, irritability, anger, resentments, withdrawal from normal routine and relationships, and feelings of worthlessness. Cognitive, memory lapses, difficult making decisions, uh, decreased ability to concentrate, blaming yourself for the situation, that's a big one, obsessive thoughts, feeling insane or crazy, or feeling stuck with low or no uh, motivation. I think we've all probably felt stuck uh, once or twice in our grief or trauma process. Okay, I just put the steps to healing trauma in here. We're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about grief a little bit more. Um, steps to healing, rest. Avoid self-medicating alcohol, caffeine, sugar, dating. People do medicate with dating. Um, allow yourself to feel your feelings. People tend to stuff away feelings and they come up in really inopportune times. Um, these feelings are things that we need to move through. This is not something to feel and be done. This is a process of moving through. So stuffing away your feelings doesn't really help you. It just 
kind of delays the process. Okay, journaling is really good. Exercise, move, walk. Um, yoga is amazing for trauma. And Peggy said, move like you've never moved before. Maybe dance or, um, you know, just whatever. To move like you've never moved before, that really actually does something in your brain. Get support. Friends, coaches, therapists. Um, I would start with friends, actually, because people are really willing to help. And if you can talk things through things with friends, sometimes you don't need a coach or a therapist. And I know I'm a coach. I'm not a therapist. I can help people who are stuck. But sometimes there's a lot of deeper things in trauma that um, a coach would not help with. OK, healing should look like this. OK, there's the expected heal <laughs> healing that we all kind of hope for. And then there's the reality, which is pretty messy. And, you know, we all know this. The problem would be here is if you were like at a flat line at the bottom, that you are not progressing. Progressing means moving forward and upward and not being a straight line at the bottom. That's when you would know that you probably need some help or if you're just spinning in the same spot. So sometimes it feels like you're moving, but you're really not. You're just sitting in the same spot and just spinning. So something to be aware of. Okay. Being in your grief, getting out there too soon, it's not a good time to be making big decisions. If you are in, in the fog, if you are in trauma, this is not a good time to be making big decisions, especially about relationships. Big mistakes can be made. Um, some of them, I just kind of threw these out there off the top of my head. I probably should have put some more thought into it. Being too foggy to see the red flags. Okay, noticing the red flags are really important and it's kind of hard when you've got the rose colored glasses on but sometimes you're too foggy just to really see what's going on and that is a dangerous situation okay putting yourself out there in a desperate way just dating 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 just anyone and everyone maybe you're being affectionate too soon um this would be how some people medicate with dating this is stuffing away your feelings um and just making yourself happy we all know love is happy so we don't want to do this though this is a mistake Okay, settling on someone be you don't want because it's better than being alone. This happens a lot. It's like we really didn't get along very well, but it was better than being alone. So I married them, you know, probably too soon. Or my thinking was I was going to fix this person because I couldn't fix my husband or my wife. Okay, you don't want to you don't want to be settling on anybody and justifying bad behavior. Sometimes it's just easy to justify it just to not be alone. So just some things to be aware of and be careful of. Okay, moving forward in a healthy way. You're finding you, your new normal, okay? Things change, we all know that things change when your spouse dies. So finding your new normal is very, very healthy. And it's liberating and it's happy. Becoming someone you really like. I think all of us have lost our identity in the spouse and in the children. So just getting an identity of somebody that you really like. Maybe some, you do doing things, you know, some things you've always wanted to do. Okay, having goals and plans for the future. When you are stuck, it's really hard to have goals or plans for the future. Also making plans for the future, our anticipation hormone dopamine kicks in, which actually stimulates our happy places. So dopamine actually plays a big part in love and attraction as well, which I will talk about later. Finding new hobbies and interests. What have you always wanted to do? Now is a really good time to do it. Being in a good place with your grief. Someone told me that they ordered a cheeseburger and Diet Coke at McDonald's and had to tell the person that they were paying, you know, here's my money. My spouse just died. OK, not you're not in a good place if you're constantly talking about it or crying on a date, which I did. Um, you're not in a good place with your grief. You need to come to the place of acceptance, um, which doesn't mean you're not sad about it or it's not affecting your life. It's just not affecting your life in that kind of a way where it's something that you're constantly focused on and talking about. Um, a really great thing to do is to look at the five stages of grief and see where you're at with those. OK, 
Okay, living a well-balanced life. I showed you the graph before. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay, you can still miss and honor your deceased spouse while doing all of these things. Standing still or spinning in a circle is not honoring your spouse. If you feel like you can't move forward because that is not honoring your spouse, that is a lie. You're lying to yourself because your spouse does want you to move forward. Your spouse would be so sad if they thought that they ruined your life by dying. So um, you can do all these things and still honor your spouse. Okay, are we ready to get out there? The two most attractive qualities you can have. Happiness and confidence. Okay, what makes us happy? Having our needs met. Having all our needs met or all our needs mostly met. So I took this from Tony Robbins' um, basic human needs. So I've kind of put together the graph. I'm going to start at the top and go to the right. Your house and kids, your job and finance. We all have a need for stability. Here's where our stability is, right? Hopefully we have a roof over our heads and food on the table. Um, the house and kids are moving forward. Things like that are happening. Self-care. Self-care is the way that we take care of ourselves in all aspects. It's not just eating and sleeping and pedicures, okay? I actually... Peggy and I did a podcast on self-care and we had six different points of self-care, including spiritual, you know, emotional, mental. There were six of them. So go check that out if you're curious or if you're struggling with self-care. Okay, social connections and dating. We are literally social beings. We have a need for other human beings. Even if we're introverts, it just looks a little different than the extroverts way of being social. Um, and I put dating in there. Dating is a social connection. Okay, church and service, I put in the same um, pie piece there um, because church is important. And I know it's hard to go to church as a single person, but I went with the goal of I'm going to learn something every single week. And that helped take away the fact, fact that I was sitting by myself or that gospel doctrine was awkward because my spouse wasn't with me with my with his arm around me. All that stuff I used to think about. It's like, I'm just going to go learn one thing today. And service. Okay, here's another human need is we have a human need to contribute or to help other people. This is kind of just in our innate wiring, which is kind of a nice thing. So make sure that service is a part of your well-balanced life. Okay, and fun and adventure. Okay, adventure is uncertainty, you know, exploring new things. And sometimes that's not always exploring caves or whatever. There's different ways to have adventures. Sometimes um, I'll take my dog for a ride through neighborhoods with great big houses. I think that's fun and adventurous. So it, it can really look like anything, but we need to have recreation and we need um, to have adventure. Okay, last need that we have is growth. We are wired for growth. And literally, that was Heavenly Father's plan for us, is to come down to earth and to learn and grow, right? And sometimes we grow in ways that we don't care for. Some of our trials are the way we grow, and those are often not very comfortable. Okay, so where would our new spouse go in this process? Around all of it. If you meet somebody who is not supportive or participating in all of these areas, then perhaps you are not with the right person, okay? This is getting all of your human needs met. This is living a happy, well-balanced life. Of course, you want your new spouse to be participating or at least supporting the process, so keep that in mind. Okay. And for ultimate happiness, do not forget to smile. When you're smiling, other people are smiling too, right? Okay, let's talk confidence a minute. I love the kitty cat. She really didn't say this, but I love that it says, I'm so great, I'm jealous of myself. Okay, 
I'm not going to tell you how to have confidence. Really, I'm giving you suggestions. If you have a hard time with confidence, if you have self-esteem issues, um, if you're still kind of in trauma and just this is a hard one, go get some help. But here's some suggestions. And maybe you can check the boxes and go, oh, wow, look it, I really am a fairly confident person or a really confident person, okay? Dues. Learn to love you for you. Are you a quiet person, the quiet spectator? Love that, okay? That's who you are. A lot of quiet spectators are super intelligent because they soak in so much information. If you're quirky and loud, love that because you're the life of the party. There's always something that you can find to love about yourself. So learn to love you for you. Okay, focus on the things that you do well. We were all born with our own talents. So focus on those and develop those. Okay, and if there's things that you don't really care for about yourself, let's start setting small goals for self-improvement, okay? Once again, this is why we're on the planet. This is why Heavenly Father sent us here to learn and to grow. Okay, get rid of your fear. Our fear gets in the way of most things. Our fear is what holds us back from getting really what we want. I spent a year of my life doing things that scared me. And I did it on purpose because I started feeling like there was a lot of things I was afraid of. And I think that was part of my grief and trauma. So like I went to a singles dance and stayed the whole time, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was. <laughs> um, I went to the place that my husband had died just to see if I felt something, but I was too afraid to go there before. I climbed the rock climbing wall because I'm afraid of heights. Um, I spent the year doing things that I normally wouldn't do. I tried Thai food, not because I was afraid of it, just because I had never done it before. And I have to tell you, by the end of this year of just facing my fears, I wasn't afraid of a whole lot. And that was a really, really good feeling. Okay, practice optimism. Look at the more of the good than the bad. If you can see the good in a situation or see more of the good in the situation than the bad, I mean, you're ahead. And that really helps us be happy and confident. Okay, some don'ts. Do not compare yourselves to others. Heavenly Father did not make us all the same. He made us all individuals. And he made us that way so we could help each other and so the world wasn't completely boring. So don't do that. You're not supposed to compare yourself to others. Okay, do not dwell on the past. Now, of course, we've lost a spouse, and that is really hard not to dwell on. But I'm talking more like past mistakes. Okay, we're not going backwards to the mistakes. If you've made some mistakes, what is the lesson in them? Learn from those and put yourself out there more educated. Okay, do not engage in negative self-talk. Literally, you are listening. Enough self-talk and you start... Uh, developing neuro pathways of negativity and those are way harder to change than if you don't create them this is what makes change hard they say it takes three weeks to change a neuro pathway like a habit a neuro pathway in your brain becomes like a habit and you don't want the habit of um talking negative about yourself or feeling negative about yourself Okay, do not play the victim. This is blaming other people and not taking responsibility. And this is really, really easy to do. I've met other widows that were suicide widows, but the way they act is like nobody else has ever lost anybody from suicide. They are the only one. They've taken it the worst. Their situation was the worst. This is not a good way to get past your grief or to live a happy um, life at all. And it is going to kill your confidence. Okay, get more confidence by knowing your stuff, by getting educated. A lot of times we can be a lot um, more confident by getting educated. I compare this to somebody who's really good at their job. Like maybe they're more confident in their job than they are in their personal life because they really, really know their job. So know your stuff, especially in dating. Here we go. Okay, I wanted to talk about science, love, chemicals, and other fun facts. This was um, life-changing for me to do all this research and to do all the studying and it's everybody else's research I just 
found it all. And I didn't, I didn't make any great discoveries myself. I'm not going to act like I did. Attraction, attachment, infatuation, and love. There is a difference. And often we think they're all the same. Let me explain. Attraction. That is our physical chemistry. That's what makes us attracted to someone. Okay, this is our pheromonal response. Okay. The best way I can explain this is this is somebody else's invisible smell. And it goes up through our nose, no joke, to, to our hypothalamus, which is our hormonal system. And we feel an attraction or we don't. Now, I always use a scale of 1 to 100 to kind of give an example of this because sometimes I've met someone in person and wow, that pheromonal response was like a 99. Holy cow, very attracted. But maybe I went out on a date with someone and I had a really good time, but the pheromonal response was more like a 20, which didn't mean there was anything wrong with them. It just meant that I wasn't having a huge physical reaction to them, which is important in love. Okay, of course we have a visual response. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, hearing, I heard somebody say that we have a response to um, all the senses. And I thought, well, hearing is weird until I was chatting with a guy and we decided to take it to the phone. And his voice was like a banjo. His voice was like this and I thought, oh, I get it. I just could not listen to this guy talk the rest of my life. It kind of spoiled any attraction that I would have had for him just talking to him on the phone. Um, and on the flip side, if someone has a really nice voice, it can kind of change things a little bit too. It's like, wow, what a great voice. Okay, touching. Touching is a great way to know if you're attracted to somebody or I'm just gonna say when you're really attracted to somebody, you want to touch them. Okay, attraction can be super powerful. A 99 pheromonal response can make you feel like you were in love. Okay, we've got some norepinephrine going that's making us feel like that swell in our chest that <gasps> and we can mistake that for love. So it's really, really important to just be aware of all these. Okay, attachment. I get a lot of people asking, am I just attached to this person or am I really in love? And hopefully I can answer all that. Okay, oxytocin and dopamine are, are our attachment chemicals. Oxytocin, um, nursing moms actually start producing oxytocin, which bonds them to babies. But oxytocin is our touch hormone. Uh, they call it the sex hormone, the hug chemical. Oxytocin makes us feel um bonded to people, which is why it's important not to start being physical too early in the relationship to confuse yourself. But dopamine literally stimulates our pleasure centers like crack cocaine. So dopamine will actually leave us feeling addicted to a person. This is why people go back to abusive relationships because they literally feel like they cannot live without this person. Okay, it's brought on by affection, spending a lot of time together and getting really comfortable with someone. This can also, um, this is our dopamine. Um, this is what makes us feel attached. Uh, sometimes a caregiver of an elderly person will take their death harder than the family because they've actually spent more time with them. So time can really bond us. So when I'm talking about attachment and dating, if you know something isn't working out and you're hanging in there anyways because you don't want to be alone for whatever reason, the longer you are with a person, the more attached you get. That dopamine hangs in there and gets and holds on tighter and tighter and tighter. And so it's really hard when you break up because you've been with that person so long, you're very comfortable. You've got all these chemicals going that are just getting stronger and stronger. Okay, let's talk infatuation for a minute. Okay, this is what we call the rose colored glasses phase. This is when everything is rainbows and butterflies and you just can't see anything wrong with a person. It's feelings of excitement, attraction and attachment. This is your serotonin and norepinephrine. All our chemicals are stimulating our serotonin, which, you know, love makes us very happy, right? And this is the norepinephrine. This is the 
Um, I call it the, the, the fake love, that jittery butterfly feeling. It makes us feel as though we're in love and it usually dies off at four to five months. So when I was in high school, I would date a boy for four months. If I was exclusive with a boy, I would date him for four months and then I would think, wow, have you always smelled that bad? Or have you always chewed that loud? Problems, maybe those weren't really problems, but problems that were there the whole time really came to light after the four to five month infatuation period. Like that kind of just kind of fizzles out all the excitement. So a lot of times I wasn't even interested in a boy after the four months. It's like, nope, I'm good. But if your relationship makes it through that, you're going to start finding that you're having little fights and that you're recognizing little problems. And this is actually the time in the relationship that you need to set some expectations and probably some boundaries as a couple. And, you know, to help the relationship grow, you probably need to, you know, figure out conflict resolution styles and how you want to communicate because little things are going to arise that you did not notice during this four to five month period. Okay, so it's really important to take your time. Um, I know that in the LDS culture, a lot of times it's really cool to meet and get married in two to four months or whatever. Um, but take four to five months to get to know somebody. Make sure you get past that period. Um, that's very exciting and a lot of people do mistake it for love, but make sure you get past that period so that you have a good foundation in place to continue the relationship or to get married or, you know, to commit to that person. Okay, causes of infatuation really quick. A lot of times people get into infatuation relationships because of they're extremely lonely or the need for validation. They have low self-esteem. So some people will continue on with these infatuous relationships, even though it really isn't a great relationship. So be aware of that. Okay, love is attraction. You must be attracted to the person. Attachment. Attachment plays a big part in love. Admiration. Okay, when you're attached to somebody and it's only attachment, there's a lot of times you can't really say what you admire about a person. If it's if all it is is attraction or attachment, maybe you're just going to say something like, oh, we just really love being together. Or we just like sitting and just snuggling. It's you need to have several different things that you admire about a person that you love. This is a big one. What do you admire about the person you love? Okay, respect. Respect needs to be served at every table and it needs to be mutual. This needs to be a person you respect and that respects you. Okay, support. Do you feel supported? Do you feel supported in all the areas of your happy, well-balanced life? And do you feel like you want to support the other person? Okay, effort. Effort is huge. A lot of times one person is putting more into the relationship the other than the other, and it's unbalanced. You do not want an unbalanced relationship. And effort is a part of love. Hopefully you're both trying to out-effort each other. Um because you do love and admire them and reciprocation once again you do not want this to be unbalanced you want to feel the same amount of love that you are putting out there okay much different than just being attracted to somebody and being attached to somebody okay let's talk breaking up and rejection because this has to do with all our love chemicals as well okay Breaking up, all your good feeling chemicals abruptly stop. So what I should say is all the chemicals that are stimulating your serotonin and endorphins and all that stuff abruptly stop because all your attachment chemicals remain, but not in an exciting way. They just are attached. So you feel like you still want this person, you still like this person, you feel still attached to this person. And of course, we have feelings of sadness and loneliness when we go through a breakup. Rejection actually stimulates the same pain centers in your brain as a physical injury. They've actually done studies where they've given people who have just recently suffered some rejection, they've given the, half the, of us a group uh, ibuprofen and Tylenol and the other half a placebo, 
and the ibuprofen and Tylenol group actually did say they felt better. So this is actually, rejection is very painful, whether it's a breakup in a relationship or maybe you didn't get the job or you got fired from a job or someone at school was mean to you, rejection is horrible all over the place. Okay, oftentimes it makes you wonder what you did wrong. You're thinking, did I do something wrong? When in actuality, it's like you're just not a good fit. Just like you have had to reject some people um, because they weren't a great fit, sometimes you're just not a great fit with somebody and you did nothing wrong. Okay, and a lot of times it fills you with self-doubt. Oh, I must not have been good enough. I wasn't pretty or handsome enough. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't funny enough. And you go to all these places in your head when you don't have to because once again, you probably just were not a good fit. Okay, what do we do with all these bad feelings? Again, we feel them. These are hard to stuff away because they're just gonna come back up. Feel your feelings. Now I tell people build a tent there, not a whole house, okay? They're going to be temporary feelings. We need to move through them. You know, we need to be progressing forward through them. We don't need to be sitting and spinning or just being stuck in the bad feelings. Okay, know that dopamine is a liar. If you think you need to go back to an abusive situation, if the situation um, is very obvious that, you know, the two of you are not compatible, it's not a good fit, your dopamine will still tell you to go back. Your dopamine will tell you that you need this person, that you want this person. And dopamine is a liar. Okay, so keep busy doing constructive things. A lot of times service really helps. If you can get outside yourself, instead of going into yourself, get outside yourself, move outside of yourself and do something for somebody else. Because honestly, when all the good chemicals stop stimulating your serotonin, you need to build serotonin. And this is a really good way to do it. Okay, practice self-care. Once again, this is more than pedicures and eating and sleeping, but pedicures are not a bad idea. Pampering yourself at this time is not a bad idea. Okay, laughing with friends. Again, serotonin. Exercise, serotonin. Realize that this is part of the process. Okay, most everybody's going to have to go through a breakup and get their heart broken. It's just part of the dating process. If you're not up to that, if you're not in a good place with your grief, maybe don't put yourself out there just yet. Because I feel like a breakup too early in your grief is like grief times three. It's like it's it's just magnified to huge degrees. So just be careful with that. So remember, you have to make out with a lot of frogs before you find your prince or princess. Okay, knowing the hazards help. Okay, red flags, let's talk about a few. Okay, scammers, widows are often targeted by scammers, so we need to know what scammers do. So this is an old list, there's a lot more um, people, of course they're gonna be out of the country, working on an oil rig, you need to send them money so they can come see you. Um, there's a lot of military people, you know, their fronting is a military person, you're gonna notice um broken english when you're chatting but let's let's talk about a few others okay they want to rush into the relationship they want to say that they're in a relationship with you they kind of want to seal the deal really fast okay they will say i love you too soon even before you meet in person this is hard you can feel a good connection with somebody online but to say i love you before you even meet in person that's a stretch okay that most people can't do that and most people shouldn't do that until you meet somebody in person. I chatted online with a guy and he came in from California. He flew in to see me and there was zero physical chemistry when all we did was laugh and joke around on the phone. So you cannot count on an I love you to be legit if you have not met in person. Okay, they will ask you to keep the relationship a secret because of course, Everybody else you know knows that this is probably a scammer or your rose colored glasses are on because you're having some great chats and your rose colored glasses are not on your friends and family. Um, this again will ask you for money, sometimes not in an obvious way. So they're not saying fund my life, but sometimes they'll send you money, which is money laundering and have you deposit to a different account. I just say keep money out of your relationship until you're exclusive or engaged, keep money out of the relationship. 
Okay, we'll give you lots of personal information about themselves in hopes that you will spill a bunch of personal information about yourself. Um, passwords. I had a guy who told me all his passwords. And then he asked, um, do you use your kids as passwords? And I was like, yeah, sometimes. And um, he was an eBay scammer. And also, I remember he got my mother's maiden name and the street I grew up because I said I was from Thousand Oaks and he was like, geez, what part? Anyways, he got a lot of information out of me just in general conversation. So um, I went in and changed all my passwords when I figured it out and called him out and he was a weirdo about it. Um, we'll be charming and give you abnormal amounts of compliments. Okay, you know who you are. If you're getting compliments on things that are not you, Okay, that is a huge red flag, and oftentimes that is a scam, or they want something from you. Okay, they're usually too good to be true. Anybody that is too good to be true, you need to not commit to. Okay, you need to figure out what their faults are, because everybody has them. If somebody looks too good to be true, they generally speaking are, so be aware of that. Okay. General and common red flags. Red flags we all know about, right? Lying, cheating, disrespectful, lazy, no compatibility. People don't generally think of this as a red flag, but this is a red flag. This is a relationship you probably shouldn't get involved in because we do get attached. No job or plan for the future. Seriously, we marry who we date. If you're dating somebody that doesn't have any motivation or plans for the future, they're probably not going to after you're married, if they're struggling to get or keep a job while you're dating, that's probably going to be the case after you're married. A marriage certificate changes very little. Same with lying and cheating. You know, it's like the marriage certificate does not guarantee that you're going to have somebody who's truthful or faithful. Okay, you find yourself always complaining. This is a big one. Write it down. What are you complaining about? Is it fixable? Are you complaining to the wrong person? Are you complaining to your friends when you should be complaining to the person? Okay, complaining about somebody is a red flag. You can either fix it or move on. Okay, someone you're dating who is not invested. Okay, this is not a person that you necessarily dump and send on their way and never speak to them again. Maybe this is a person that you just date casually because they really aren't invested and you do not want to put all the investment into the relationship, even if you really like them. And that's hard. If you really like someone, this is hard, but I'm telling you, you're gonna be better off. Okay, you feel like you are putting more into the relationship than they are. Maybe you're always making the plans. Um, you're always the one to reach out. You feel like the backup plan, not the plan. Like maybe after they hang out with their friends or their family, then maybe they have some time for you. Or um, maybe they'll call you on a night, spur of the moment, hey, I got nothing going on tonight. Do you want to go out? Okay, you do not want to be the backup plan. Frequent canceling. They probably got a better offer because they're just not all that invested. Um, little to no communication throughout the day. People are often confused by this. Someone who says they like them, but they won't return a text for hours or sometimes even days. So this is a low invested person, okay? Once again, we don't want to put a lot of investment into this person. And not in a mean way. You don't have to say, well, you're not invested, so I'm not invested. You just don't. You just don't commit to this person and see other people. Okay, won't introduce you to family and friends. Again, not, not invested enough. They treat you like a dying plant. You only get watered when you're drooping. Okay, you only get attention when you're ready to leave, pretty much. And that happens a lot, you would notice if you were in this situation. Okay, serious red flags do not proceed. Someone who tries to control you. Now, let me just tell you. A lot of red flags can be pink flags or white flags by asking clarifying questions. This, this behavior confuses me. If you're asking the questions and the behavior does not change, if you're setting boundaries and the behavior does not change, these are serious, serious red flags. Someone who tries to control you once and you're like, that was kind of controlling. Is that generally your nature? And they're like, oh my gosh, no, that was a mistake. And they never do it again. Obviously not a red flag. So I hope we get all that. Okay, somebody that secludes you from family and friends. Once again, rose-colored glasses are on, but they aren't on your family and friends. So of course they're gonna seclude you because 
everybody else can see that they're a dirt bag and you can't. Okay, we'll be super charming one minute, then mean the next. Or maybe they're mean to the wait staff or the valet or, or whoever. And you need to know that any mean behavior is not good. It doesn't matter how charming they are or how nice they are when they're not being mean. And if they're mean to the valet or the wait staff, eventually that behavior is going to come around to you. You need to know that that is, um, that is a thing that's going to happen. Okay, we'll turn things around so it appears to be your fault. This is when you're trying to clarify, I'm confused about this behavior. They either tell you you're crazy or they twist things around so that it's your fault. And it's very confusing. And if you're confused, that is a red flag. Or if it's just mean behavior. We'll try to knock you down a few notches if you are succeeding. If you are being excited about your success and all they're trying to do is knock you down, this is a huge red flag. Okay, they see themselves above you as a person and so if you start climbing the ladder to be equal to them they don't like that they will knock you down okay we'll manipulate you to stretch your boundaries not generally because they want to do something that's outside of your boundaries just to see if they can it's this is a control thing if somebody's always trying to get you to to stretch your boundaries be very aware okay we'll give you a really good apology but their behavior does not change of course actions speak louder than words we'll make you question yourself or just not like yourself if you start to think am i crazy or maybe you just don't like yourself when you're around this person you have a hard time finding your smile or um or just you know finding things to like about yourself you just feel down maybe around them this is another red flag Okay, Jeffrey R. Holland has our back. He says, in a dating or courtship relationship, I would not have you spend five minutes with someone who belittles you, one who is constantly critical, one who is cruel at your expense, and may even call it humor. Life is tough enough without having the person who is supposed to love you lead the assault on your self-esteem, sense of dignity, your confidence, and your joy. Uh, he goes on to say that this person should make you feel safe, which is true. You should feel safe around a person that claims to love you. Okay, so take your time. I recommend all four seasons and a road trip. So number one, narcissists, anybody with mental illness, they, they usually start misbehaving. They'll be on really good behavior, but they'll usually start misbehaving around eight or nine months. When I've coached some people who hung in there a year, they would say, oh, it really went bad around eight to nine months. Okay, mental illness, narcissists, um, sociopaths, all this stuff, um, they cannot behave themselves past a certain amount of time. So that's one important thing. I also use my parents as an example because my parents married in January, or they met in January and they married in April. My mom literally went crazy every Christmas of my life. And, you know, she'd be in the kitchen bawling, she'd be having some kind of meltdown, she'd pick a fight. And maybe dad should have known that before he married, or maybe he could have figured out damage control because as it was, it was really frustrating. Uh, the kids, we all just kind of blew it off because it was Christmas and Santa just came, but just kind of a weird thing. But it would might have been nice for him to know, maybe not a deal breaker, but you know, damage control. So just be careful. And it's not going to kill you to take your time. Nobody's going to go away if they're really loving you, right? It's just a good way to get to know what you're getting yourself into. Okay, let's talk boundaries. Okay, I call boundaries the fence we build around our values. If you haven't established what your values are, they're pretty easy if we're members of the church and boundaries will change in a dating situation. The longer you date, you're gonna find, oh wow, you're building more boundaries. You're setting more boundaries. Um, so boundaries are super important in any relationship. Mom, dad, kids, siblings, friends. Okay, sticking to healthy boundaries shows good self-esteem. You teach people how to treat you. You do not put up with bad behavior. Okay, narcissists, sociopaths, people who would mistreat you, control people who are controlling, they tend to avoid people with healthy boundaries. If they try to stretch your boundaries and you stick with them, they will pass you by. In most cases, not all cases. I mean, some people really like a good challenge, but healthy boundaries really shows good self-esteem. And you are not a target if you have really good self-esteem. 
Okay, boundaries are your rules. You don't have to explain or justify yourself to anyways. Sometimes it's kind of nice to explain like, hey, my kids got really attached to my last boyfriend, so you can't meet them until we're more serious. You know, sometimes that's kind of a polite way to set a boundary, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to explain or justify. In fact, we just did a podcast on boundaries where we talk about a lot of different boundary situations. Okay, boundaries are a good way to see how much somebody really cares for you. If someone respects you, they will honor your boundaries. So this is a small example, but um, when I was dating after my husband passed, I had a teenage daughter who would wait up for me. So I always made my curfew midnight. And some guys would be like, oh, well, the movie gets out at 1230. And I'd be like, no, I need to be home. You know, and other guys would have me home at 1155. So it just really shows how much somebody cares for you and respects you if they are honoring your boundaries. Okay, boundaries are only boundaries if you stick to them. Otherwise, they're only words. If you start stretching some boundaries, um, that person's going to ex expect you to stretch all your boundaries. So you stick to your boundaries. Okay, how do we put all of this together? I call them my big C's of relationships. I should probably change it. I thought it was cute in the beginning of my coaching career. Chemistry. Okay, that's our physical attraction. You cannot have a good relationship without really good physical attraction. Okay, connection. This is the next step, okay? Things in common or common goals. Are you going in the same direction spiritually? Are you going in the same direction financially? Do you have the same financial goals for the future? This is all stuff that we should be talking about. This is the glue that holds the relationship together. So you need to have some forms of connection in place before we get to contact, which is our affection. Remember, we get really attached to people through affection. So we need some glue there to know that this relationship is going to go somewhere and it's not just all affection. And of course, affection too soon really confuses us. Do we have feelings for this person or is it all this exciting chemicals that we're getting from the affection? Okay, conflict res resolution and communication. You can do this anywhere in the relationship so far, right? But a lot of times you're just so happy getting to know each other. It's all rainbows and butterflies that that doesn't come to that. But at some point in the relationship, you need to get to conflict resolution. How are you going to resolve conflict? Okay, conflict is inevitable, but fighting is optional. And so I don't know any couple who would say, oh, if we're going to talk about conflict, I like slamming doors and yelling and screaming. Of course not. But if you talk about your conflict resolution style and it turns into screaming and door slamming, you can say, stop, this is not how we decided to do this and do what you decided, okay? Communication. Hopefully you're going to have the same communication styles or you figure that out, okay? Good communication is really important. Then we go to commitment. So you'll want to do all these things before you get into a committed situation just to be safe, right? Okay, what now? Let's put yourself out there. Where do we start? That's where everybody asks me. Where do I find someone to date? Okay, if you live in Utah, this is pretty easy. I know California has a big social circle. I'm not sure about other places. Um, but hopefully there's a good social structure. The church has a good social structure for you. Um, potlucks, barbecues, parties, um, Singles, family, home and evenings, and firesides. I know here in Utah, there's always several fire firesides to choose from. And it's just putting yourself out there. I like to meet people in person because then you know if you kind of have a physical connection. I'm not much of an online person, but I know like introverts, a lot of introverts prefer online. It's just an easier way through the process of, you know, getting to chat and everything. Okay, dances. If you're a dancer, go to dances. Online dating, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Networking, this is where you tell your friends and family, I am ready to date. Maybe you tell your coworkers, I'm ready to date. Maybe you tell the people at the dentist office. Um, but I always say, give them some criteria. If you're a big hiker, then you would say, hey, 
if you run into anybody who's really cute, they're active LDS and they really like hiking, you know, send them my way, set me up kind of thing. That way you're not just getting set up with anyone who's single because I have been on a lot of nightmare blind dates. I've heard of a lot of nightmare blind dates. You don't want those. So give people some criteria to go off of, you know, whatever your interests are. Or um, let's say, oh, I guess that's the next one, doing things you love. Okay. What a great thing. To, we're at a great place to meet people. Let's say dancing. You love dancing or ballroom dancing. Go to a ballroom dancing place or just go to the dances if you like dances, because guess what? You're going to find other people that like dancing. I know there's a big hiking group here. It's a huge hiking group here in Utah. Um, if you really like hiking, go to the hiking group because you're going to find somebody that really likes hiking. So in networking, like say you like horseback riding, the equestrian center you know tell them i'm looking for someone who likes to ride horses so if anybody comes in that's my age like let me know okay doing things you love is great because then you know you have similar hobbies okay giving the green light and flirting well boy this is sure much more fun when i do it in a live class but let's go for it anyways eye contact extended eye contact there's a lot of things you can do with your eyes winking raising your eyebrows but extended eye contact is a good way to kind of show interest. If somebody is talking to you, you know, really intently listening with your eyes is a good way to give the green light. Compliments. Compliments are great. Everybody loves compliments. Okay, you can you can combine <laughs> one or two of these. We'll get into that in a second. Touching. You can touch somebody while you give a compliment. You can touch somebody while you are intently listening to them with your eyes. Humor and teasing. Be careful with this one, but this one can be fun. Of course, everybody loves to laugh, right? So if you're humorous, be careful with the teasing, especially if it's jokes at their expense. Um, someone in the class asked about sarcasm. If sarcasm is your language and you go to sarcasm, all the time then maybe find somebody who speaks sarcasm but sarcasm is okay every once in a while just be careful with that one okay make sure you have an open body language um two of my friends had connected they um we were at a conference and they figured out that they had a person in common we're talking about them but one of them closed their arms and so the other one did and i was like obviously there is not a love connection here okay if you're interested in somebody, open up your body to them. Open body language. Do not be crossing your arms, crossing your legs. Stay open to them. Smiling, of course. I always forget to smile. Not always, but I feel like I forget to smile a lot when I'm deep in thought and I'm out in social situations. So smiling, of course, is good. But smiling in eye contact, smiling in compliments, smiling in touching. And when I say touching, I mean appropriate touching. Fist bumps, high fives, hugs. Um, and asking get to know you questions. Maybe don't ask the staples, or if you're gonna ask the staples, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh my gosh, that sounds fascinating. What's your favorite part? Okay, get to know you questions. Maybe talk about things. Oh, the fa my favorite part of my job, my job is boring, but my favorite part is this. So um, things that would make them feel good. Ask questions that would make them feel good. Um, telling them what you want. Oh my gosh, you're fun. We should go out sometime. This is a hard one but there's some people I know that can pull it off and guess what that is the ultimate green light <laughs> to say we should go out sometime because then there's no question at all another green light is I get this question all the time should girls ask men out so I'm just gonna say girls ladies yes ask a guy out but only ask him out once if you have a good time he's gonna ask you out the next time okay if he didn't have a good time and you ask him out again, then he's going to tell you no. And all of a sudden we're in rejection land. So just be careful with that one. So I always say, ask him out once. And you could even say at the end of the day, hey, I had a great time. I would love to go out again, but I'm putting the ball in your court. But that is the ultimate, ultimate green light is asking a guy out, ladies. Okay, online dating. Of course, we need to be honest. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about that in a second. Okay, keep it brief. You do not need to give your life story. If you give your life story, there's nothing to talk about. There's no questions to ask. You wanna keep it brief and even a little mysterious. 
Okay, be honest. There's nothing worse. I've done it so many times, getting to a date and having somebody be completely different than their pictures. Um, or maybe they've said they're taller than they really are. It's like you want to show up and see the person that you think you're going to go out with. My brother, he said that he um, met with one lady. She, all her um, pictures had her hair colored brunette and she was salt and peppery and he didn't even recognize her. So make sure that you're honest with your pictures and, you know, with how you're describing yourself and with your life. Honestly, don't say that you like camping because there's somebody cute online that really likes camping. Don't do it because this just sets you up to have the other person disappointed. Okay, don't say what you don't want. Okay, don't put it out there. If you wear a pocket protector, I'm not interested. Okay, don't say what you're not going to be interested in because you don't know, actually. And another thing is keep it lighthearted, okay? You want it to be light and fun and you want to keep that person smiling when they're reading your profile. Okay, don't state the obvious. Things like, I don't like drama. Guess what? You're just wasting words, okay? Um, I love to laugh. Well... I'm going to say that's most everybody on the planet, okay? You don't need to state the obvious. I've been hurt by love. That one's my favorite. Obvious. Okay, and negative. Use humor. Of course, you want somebody smiling when they're reading your profile. Okay, I always end with a question. End with a question because sometimes it's hard to reach out. And for me anymore, somebody who reaches out with hi, I just say hi back. I'm not going to engage in a conversation with somebody who all they can do is say hi. When they come out and say hi, especially like on Facebook, they've seen something that I've put on a singles page or something, they reach out with hi. I'm like, I'm not even gonna give you the time of day because I think you've just said hi to about 20 women and you're just gonna see who takes the bait kind of thing. So if you end with a question, then it's easy for someone to reach out and answer that question. I always use the road trip thing. I really like a good road trip. So what's your favorite road trip snack? So if somebody really likes a road trip, then they have road trip snacks and they can answer that, right? So there's a bunch of examples I could use, but we're keeping this short. Um, good pictures, doing things that you like to do. You don't need to say what you like to do if you have good pictures. These are me, for those of you who don't know me. Do I need to say I'm adventurous if I have these pictures? I don't. Okay, do I need to say I like tacos if I have this picture, okay? I like hiking. I really liked, this is me using humor. I buy a thing that says cougar because I'm older. And then it says be wild where I thought the picture was hilarious. Okay, bad pictures. Okay, unless a woman has got gym selfies, she does not want to see gym sel selfies, men. And um, Snapchat filters. Most men say they hate them. Plus you can't, you're hiding. You're hiding behind a Snapchat filter. Okay, I have seen so many profiles <laughs> With dead animals, okay, I guess you like fishing and scenery. Okay, that's great and beautiful, but I wanna know who you are, okay? I guess I know that you like to take pictures or that you go fishing, but I wanna know more of who you are through your pictures. Okay, here's an example of a profile, and I'm gonna say it's one not to use. Okay, I'm fun-loving, smart, energetic, loyal, adventurous, and I am always game to learn new things. I love a long walk in the park or a car ride up the canyon, okay? It's short, it describes the person, but it also describes my dog. Okay, let's do something clever than sounding like somebody's golden retriever. So I suggest this, you don't have to say 10 things about me. You could say five things about me. Um, making a list and try to be clever and try to promote some questions. I have an unhealthy relationship with chocolate. So of course I like chocolate. I love Jesus seven days a week. I guess that's a more clever way of saying I'm active, LDS. Okay, feed me tacos, that's my favorite food. I love to travel, take me to the beach. Okay, here's some questions. Where have you traveled to? What beaches do you like? Um, have you been to a beach in this city? Okay, questions, hiking is my therapy. Another one, especially around Utah, so many places to hike. Have you hiked Mount Olympus? Okay, um, Halloween is my favorite holiday. That's for me, that's more of a warning because I have more Halloween decor than Christmas. I'll cook if you clean up after. I could say I make a mean lasagna, but 
I'll just say, uh, I'll cook if you clean up after. And somebody can say, well, what's, what's the best thing you cook? Do you bake? So make sure there's things on here um, that promote some questions that are clever, that might make somebody smile. Um, and then the question is, where are you taking me on our first date? That is pretty, <laughs> that, that's pretty forward. Um, I would do that. Not everybody would do that, but I, I, I would pull that. Okay, online dating safety, really quick. Never give out personal information. Nobody needs your social security number, banking info, monthly income even. Okay, no personal stuff. Never loan anybody money, transfer money. We talked about that. Just keep money out of dating altogether. Always meet up at a central location around other people. Do I need to say this? I do. Nobody in the beginning of a relationship or first, second, third dates needs to go to your house to see where you live, okay? And then let somebody know where you are, okay? You don't know these people usually. I, you know, since Facebook is a thing and Instagram, I started stalking people on Facebook to make sure they're real. Um, it's a good idea. You can see what their life is kind of like. Okay, you don't have to give out your last name even if you're in the early stages. And do not post pictures of your children. There are some weirdos out there, both male and female. Just keep your kids safe. Okay, final advice. Have fun. Don't take yourself too seriously, okay? You're not, not every person is a potential Mr. or Mrs. Wright, okay? If you're too serious about this, you're not going to have a good experience. So, see the adventure in this um take your time of course there's no rush stay safe practice safety all the time and learn from your mistakes especially if you have a system let's say you have a system of doing the same thing every time and it's not working figure out a different system okay this is where you can find me um facebook i'm at dating again Peggy and I actually have Date to Your Potential, a dating discussion page now, and I have a speed dating group where we're going to, I think the next speed dating activity we're planning for June up the canyon, up Provo Canyon in Utah. So here's where you can find me. Thank you so much for joining in today.